Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm Bob Insminger, the provost. Um, it's uh, good to see so many folks out. I hope you're having a good weekend, uh, and I know you're going to enjoy uh, the next event on the schedule. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Lombardi. Uh, many of you know Joe at least as well as I do, and some of you at least for a longer duration. Uh, but as you know, he's been a professor of biology here for 34 years has served the faculty in many distinguished capacities, uh, in the classroom, in the laboratory, and in many other roles. Um, but Joe's talents are not limited to those that he's displayed as a member of the faculty. Uh, as you probably also know, Joe uh, is a talented folk musician. He's performed with the Boomers. Uh, he's performed with the faculty folk music performers who will be entertaining at the reception this afternoon for Dr. Lombardi and the Flemings, and I hope you'll be there. Um, what you may not know... Uh-oh. <laughs> ...is that Joe is also uh, proficient as a terpsichorean. Um, I have it on good authority that Joe once appeared in a yellow tutu wearing antennae <laughs> and, and performed at the Miss Hendricks pageant an interpretive dance to the flight of the bumblebee. <laughs> now, now, we know that uh, the faculty folk music performers will be performing this afternoon. Whether Joe intends to reprise his performance for <laughs> Miss Hendricks no. is still a, an open question, but we can only hope. Please welcome Joe Lombardi. Thanks, Bob. I think I'm going to hook, hook up with this thing. Uh, th thank you all for coming out, by the way. Uh, Bob, thank you. Uh, I'm going to say quite a bit more about the things that you don't know about me and also put, a, uh, put to rest some of these ugly, ruthless rumors uh, that have been going on. Uh, but um, as I've uh, seen some uh, last lectures, uh, what I love the most about them is learning uh, something about the faculty members uh, that uh, we would not know as colleagues, uh, unless we knew them very well, we would not know them from committee meetings and uh, faculty meetings. And uh, as students, you would not know uh, uh, about us simply from what we do in the classroom or as advisors and that sort of thing. So um, I, w I kind of have two goals. One is to uh, give you some of that information uh, and also to maybe give you, uh, you know, a little bit of wisdom, if I've gained any over these, uh, these years. Uh, but we'll uh, not worry so much about the wisdom and have a little bit more uh, fun. By the way, this morning I was at a uh, little, um, uh, we call it the picking porch. It was over in the uh, library, uh, the Faulkner County Library. And we'd just sit around, kind of round robin and play uh, music. And I don't know how it started. Uh, Ralph McKenna was there. But uh, for the last hour and a half, they were playing all of these old folk songs where people died, where they got hung, <laughs> where got killed, and things like that. So y'all, let's pick things up a little bit. Um, anyway, this is my last lecture. Uh, but I, you know, we talk at Hendricks quite a bit about uh, our passions and uh, callings and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I was asked by um, Wayne Clark, Reverend uh, Clark, to do uh, call many, many years ago to do a. Uh, a, what they call a Tuesday talk. Some of you uh, are familiar with that, where you uh, talk about uh, your callings and uh, your calling and what it is that uh, uh, you know, uh, brought you where you, where you are. And uh, to me, that was a very um, linear thing uh, because it was a fr I'd never thought about uh, my passions or calling or why I was here and how I got here, that sort of thing. I thought I was very happy to be here for the job. But uh, so it was the first opportunity to start thinking along those lines. Uh, and it was kind of, kind of really, uh, really neat for me. But it was very linear. Uh, you know, I said, well, I had some experiences uh, as a summer camp, and I've talked to uh, several people about those experiences, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, those today. Uh, that certainly inspired me in biology and, uh, and got me really interested in nature and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I uh, kind of took that to uh, being a biology professor. So it was a very linear uh, and stuck to biology. And uh, so here, here's doc, Dr. Chapel with his wisdom. Uh, and I don't know if you uh, remember this, Chuck, but you were uh, in the audience there, and you knew me fairly well. And at that talk, I said, Joe, how about soccer? You haven't said anything about soccer. You haven't said anything about music and that sort of thing. 
and it never occurred to me that that was maybe a component of those passions and callings uh, and that sort of thing. And as I uh, think back, I probably could have been a high school soccer coach. I could have been a, you know, a folk musician, maybe. Uh, luck having it. Yeah I, yeah, I have no idea. At which case, I would be talking in a very different way about my calling and my passions and things like that. So, um, so my second Tuesday talk, um, I, I don't think you were at that one, uh, Chuck, which was just a few years ago, and Wayne said, well, it's been a long time since you uh, had given a Tuesday talk, so all the students uh, have already graduated, so you can go ahead and, and talk again. So I thought I'd do something a little bit more interesting, and based on uh, Dr. Chappell's comments at the first uh, Tuesday talk, say, well, let me you know, talk about some of these other aspects of uh, you know, passions and callings and things like that. So it's, it, as I kind of termed it, my callings. And, um, and what I did was talk more about what we now do call avocations, okay? So since I was a biology, biology professor, uh, so I have all these avocations. Uh, but these were also initial passions, and I could have gone in any, you know, any number of directions. And he said, oh yeah, I'm thinking about maybe having uh, sessions by the faculty uh, talking about their avocations. I said, well, that, that's kind of neat, Wayne, but that's not exactly what I was getting at. Uh, you know, they're not just avocations. They happen to be avocations now, uh, but they could have very easily been, uh, been something that we would have pursued. And my whole life uh, might have been uh, very, very different. So um, kind of say, well, why can't we have you know, poly, <laughs> be poly passionate about things. You know, why can't we be poly called? You know, so that, that's kind of where I want to take uh, my last lecture. That's that little, little piece of wisdom. And then just give you a lot of examples about uh, how, that, uh, how those uh, things flowed. Uh, and also in so doing, uh, since uh, Provost Esmeer is here, uh, is to use a metaphor uh, to, to, to try to fi find a good meta metaphor for this. Uh, but just to read this, uh, so, and I won't, I, most of these are just going to be fast picture slides, so we'll, we'll hope you go through this uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so, uh, so as we flow with these passions, uh, they interconnect in many, uh, uh, usually quite unsuspected, so keep kind of that in the back of your mind. Uh, and all these experiences set the stage uh, for what, whatever is coming next. So everything we're doing is kind of, in, in a way, rehearsing uh, for who knows what. Uh, is coming next in our life. So we are somewhat rehearsed. So with that uh, notion, uh, let's think of maybe this, where we are right now, as uh, all my history uh, being my rehearsals uh, you know, for retirement, uh, and these will be then rehearsing for whatever is uh, you know, coming next. And uh, as you'll see, I probably have no idea what those are going to be. So uh, let's look at a metaphor. So the uh, Tuesday talk, the last one that I, I did, uh, where I kind of had the callings, and I, was, uh, I used the metaphor uh, at that uh, of smoke, because you have kind of the energy, uh, you know, the puffs of smoke in different directions, and so on, and they mingle. And uh, a few students asked me a question, said, well, how come, how do you know that you were supposed to go in this direction or that direction, um, and so on. And so the, my, my analogy, uh, or my metaphor started breaking down, and especially when you think of wind coming through and just dissipating everything, uh, you know, there. And, you know, that sometimes happens, I'm sure, in our lives, but that's probably uh, not uh, the best metaphor. There are good, in any metaphor, there are good aspects of it, in this case, the smoke metaphor. And there are also the, you know, the uh, things that don't work so much or the bad things about the metaphor. So, so I decided uh, now to, uh, to have a different metaphor, and that metaphor is a, an erupting volcano. And... Uh, and what's really neat about the volcano uh, is that here you can see the uh, lava flowing. So we're kind of starting out with this erupt our energy, our passion, uh, that then flows. And depending on the strength of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the lava flow or the energy, we can go around obstacles, over obstacles, um, you know, whatever. That's, uh, that's our energy and uh, passion. But also now you notice that uh, there is more than one. Okay, remember we're talking about passions. And so... Uh, you can have any uh, number of these that are flowing from the initial from the initial source. They're all going in different directions, and uh, and also what happens is uh, in a volcano they start connecting in very uh, interesting ways. Uh, so you have all of you might say our you know, initial passions or whatever they are, and they connect and then they branch off, uh, and they also uh, do the same thing with uh, with other uh, portions of the volcano. In other words, other people uh, that might. Um, also be coming in contact with us at a later time. So, um, but before I do that, so that's kind of the metaphor, uh, and we're going to be, uh, we're talking about that. 
Uh, there have been some really ugly and, uh, what I say, ruthless rumors uh, going on. And one, this, this is a picture that was uh, taken, uh, was put in the, um, not the profile, the, um, what's our, uh, Troubadour, thank you, uh, in the Troubadour. Uh, this, by the way, is an interactive lecture. Okay. Uh, and uh, there was not a name given, okay, so who this, but it said it's a faculty member and so on. And there was this rumor going around uh, that uh, it was me. So I want to put, put to rest at this time. There is no tattoo. The other rumor is that I was Miss Hendricks, a uh, contestant, uh, and uh, that is not me. Uh, rumor has it that this person dressed up in a tutu as a honeybee and did a honeybee waggle dance as their talent. Come on. It's, for the record, when I cross-dress, <laughs> this is what I look like. No way is that me. OK. It is true that I judged a Miss Hendricks, uh, or actually a few uh, Miss Hendricks. And what I would try to do uh, is dress you know, to, to be compatible with that, uh, that particular um, event. So uh, here I am. And, and you can already contrast, contrast uh, my colleagues, in this case, uh, Mark Sutherland, so here's a Saturday evening, and he's going to uh, do a musical performance with the men's uh, choir in Little Rock, with the probably with the symphony orchestra. And here I am uh, judging Miss Hendricks. Uh, sometimes I like to be contradictory. Uh, I'll have a contradiction, uh, and uh, so this is uh, the contradiction. Obviously, it's a Miss Hendricks. I'm also judging Miss Hendricks here, and. Uh, and you can see, obviously, I'm dressed as a monk, the uh, frock. But a few things that you would not notice, so I'll point these out. Uh, the book that I have here, uh, the title, of that's uh, Milton. So you would, you would enjoy this, uh, Bob Milton, uh, Paradise Lost. And that's what I was, I was carrying, carrying that as the book. And the other thing you may not notice, uh, but if you look at the, uh, under the frock there, you can just see, and this is a, a black t-shirt, and it, the name is Illuminati. So I have an Illuminati t-shirt. Uh, on you. My guess is you're all not looking that closely at those details of my outfit. <laughs> uh, my other prop, my other prop, uh, some of you may know as uh, Elisa uh, Helly, who uh, in real life, uh, there she was my college ETA. So. And I think she probably put that on her time card when she uh, went with me to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Miss Hendricks. <laughs> OK, well, let's start now, the little erupting volcano. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't know if Karen uh, Frazier is here, but I want to thank uh, Karen uh, for taking some of these very old photographs and two by two slides and digitizing them for me, doing a wonderful job. Uh, this picture must be close uh, to as old as I am, uh, easily. <laughs> but I don't remember too much way back there. Uh, this is first grade uh, picture, and I don't really have too much in the way of recollections uh, there. But I, where I really want to start, and I start uh, many of these uh, talks about passions and calling uh, with experiences that I've had and th have, that have really been uh, important uh, to me, and I'll, I'll, I want to uh, use these, uh, this kind of as a continuing um, example. Uh, this is a, a summer camp. It's called the Paradise Farms uh, Camp. It's uh, run by an organization called the Children's Country Week Association in uh, Pennsylvania, about uh, full 15, more than that, maybe 30 miles outside of uh, Philadelphia, west of Philadelphia, in just some beautiful uh, rolling hills of Pennsylvania. Now, you have to appreciate, I grew up in uh, center, not quite center city, but in uh, Philadelphia, where really uh, I was exposed to concrete, uh, bricks, and those sorts of things. And uh, this particular uh, camp, you can see there's some cabins and some other uh, individual cabins and uh, other activity uh, uh, structures in the back there. Uh, I'm not in this picture, but, uh, but the kids, this is a picture of some of the kids from there. 
uh, which really says a lot. This camp was for underprivileged kids in Philadelphia. Uh, kid, I didn't realize I was underprivileged, you know, or, or poor or whatever. I know some, uh, we didn't uh, have to pay very much, if anything, uh, for my sisters and um, for I to go to the, uh, to the camp. Uh, but that's what it was. And this was an opportunity uh, for uh, kids in Center City to get some experiences outside in the rolling hills of Pennsylvania. I didn't realize it um, uh, until uh, I was uh, preparing for a environmental studies uh, presentation that I gave a little while ago uh, that this is very, very close to the same uh, area that Rachel Carson uh, grew up in. Uh, and uh, this is really the point I want to make, that, that it's, it's this experience uh, that really allowed me to connect uh, to the natural world, which I probably would not have been able to do, or if it occurred, it would have been much, much uh, later. I went to the camp from age uh, eight uh, until uh, and then I became a counselor, uh, and so I um, uh, was there all the way through, uh, through college, basically. So as a camper and a counselor, so this, is, this was my summer, and I would look forward to, uh, to those. Uh, well, here's the, uh, uh, some of the uh, campers. There I am, in this case. Uh, notice the Indian, uh, Native American, I guess we should, really should say, uh, a, a lot of that area has a real rich Native American history. Uh, so it's not surprising that the camp, uh, the, you know, we did the uh, cabins and a lot that we did there uh, were oriented to um, Native American uh, cultures and things like that. Uh, Cayuga, Cherokee, so on. But uh, so there, there's me then from Cayuga cabin. And this is just the oldest picture. I could, I could give you a hundred of these pictures. I'll spare you. Uh, but this is the uh, only the youngest one I have, so I was about ten uh, in this uh, in this picture right here. So uh, I want to make this point, and so I'll just do it uh, with a slide. And this is one I used uh, at the environmental uh, presentation, and this is from Rachel Rachel Carson, and she wrote a, a very wonderful book, a very short book with a lot of uh, had been illustrated uh, subsequent to uh, her death, uh, called A Sense of Wonder, and in it she makes this point and counselors that I've talked to at uh, camp uh, and other people that have had similar experiences basically say the same thing. They, rec they realize this. They understand this. Uh, if a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscover with him the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. And I think as important, if not more important, is uh, comes a little later in the sense of wonder. I sincerely believe that for the child, and we, I can add this adults as well. Uh, it is not half so important to know as to feel, because this is where the passion is coming. It's after that, then you start knowing and learning and getting uh, you know, re information and so on. But somewhere you need to light that uh, you need to light that spark, and that's what I think summer camp did for me as well as many other people that experienced that. Okay, so as a camper and a counselor, the, remember, well, let's not lose track of our metaphor, okay? Because <laughs> uh, I, in planning this, I said, how the heck am I going to, you know, because there's a lot of connections there. So in the back of your mind, you have to continually, you know, think about, uh, about these connections and interactions and things like that, if I fail to, uh, to remind you. Okay, uh, so with camper, as I mentioned, nurturing uh, what E.O. Wilson calls a biophilia connection, uh, that he feels that humans have uh, inherently uh, with the natural world if they, are if they can experience it, very much like learning language. You're, you're already predestined to do that, but you need to have uh, those experiences. He feels that we have that propensity to make a connection with nature, but we need to, uh, we need to have those early experiences. Um, I was uh, an athletic counselor uh, all through high school. Uh, I became, after that, as I'll show you, a hiking and nature counselor, a nature counselor when I, uh, I became a biologist. Uh, but uh, through um, elementary school, uh, high school, uh, I, w I was a jock. You probably would not realize that, <laughs> how out of shape I am uh, now. But, uh, uh, and then later I became a hiking and nature counselor, really a nature counselor. We used to call it the hiking because obviously we'd have to hike out to, you know, we'd have turtle hikes, we'd have uh, uh, creek hikes, uh, we would have berry hikes, whatever it was that would get us out into nature. Uh, doing something. Uh, but also it was at camp that uh, my musical roots, whatever roots I had in music, uh, they started there as well. Uh, this is not me, uh, but this is one of the counselors, uh, as I said, very uh, Native American oriented. Uh, <coughs> uh, you can see the campers uh, in the background. They have torches. 
uh, and uh, then because uh, and I'll show you what one of those trail guards look like to uh, light the trail for people uh, coming. A lot of visitors would come to these uh, Indian dances. Uh, the uh, we had three camps there. One uh, the one I showed you uh, was called uh, Camp Whitesell, but we had two other camps there: one for younger boys and one for uh, uh, women. And they would all come to this big Indian circle and watch the uh, dancers perform uh, Indian dances and other kinds of ceremonies. So here's a trail guard. <laughs> okay, and then we'll go to a counselor. And uh, here's my one of my uh, cabins. And I was, uh, probably at this time I was uh, still maybe in high school. I'm not sure I was in college yet, uh, but you can see me there as a counselor. And there's uh, with the yeah. I was looking for the loincloth. I can't, maybe, but uh, you, what you can't see, what you can't see in this picture is that I actually have a um, a torch, and what I was doing here was a torch dance, uh, and uh, and those of you that know me know that I'm not one to like to be the center of attention. <laughs> but uh, what I really wanted to do, and I would practice this and be able to do it, is do a triple flip with the you know, so I was dancing and you know do all this kind of. Stuff. So uh, that's the picture I have. <laughs> okay, uh, so here's a uh, few of the counselors uh, one year, and I'm showing this particular picture to make uh, some points. Connections, uh, lava flows, right? Okay, metaphor. Uh, uh, there I am. Uh, this was my athletic uh, co counselor uh, with me that particular year. I hope this is going to work okay. Uh, my mentor, and I won't say a lot more uh, too much about uh, this person, his name is Bill Belzer. He also became a biologist. Uh, he um, is now doing research uh, in um, Pennsylvania on box turtles, uh, developing a love for box turtles back here at camp. But he was the nature counselor, and uh, he was a counselor when I was a camper. He's about five years, four years older than I am. And, um, and he was certainly one of my major uh, inspirations in terms of getting me into nature and you know, giving me that, uh, that sense of wonder, kind of that sense of wonder. But again, I was the jock here, so I, here's our uh, athletic counselor. And I also want to point out uh, this person back here. And his name is uh, Joe Balf. And uh, just kind of, yeah. OK, so here's uh, Joe Balf, kind of looking at that nice face. Uh, oh, okay. I, I was not a very stellar high school student. Uh, but uh, it's really interesting as I was going back through some old, old stuff. Here is an award I got uh, in biology. We had uh, as, uh, one year, uh, or at least I think one semester in biology, uh, we were taught at least a few days a week uh, through a television uh, in a big auditorium. And, uh, and this was projected to a lot of different high schools. So at the uh, end of the semester, uh, they would choose one student from each of the high schools to be in a quiz, their, their best student. I said, wow, I was actually good at something back then. But you can see all the way back in high school, here's uh, 1962, so I was in 10th grade uh, there, uh, you know, already uh, some interest uh, in, in you know, biology. There was some, uh, some passion there. Okay, I want to show you this. I don't have, too, unfortunately, too many pictures of some of the, of, you know, as a counselor. Uh, this was actually taken by the director of the camp. Uh, but this, we called this a mud hike. Uh, but it, I mean, started out as a, a regular hike where we'd look at some of the, you know, try to find some uh, critters, um, you know, look at uh, some of the other uh, aspects of the environment. And, uh, and again, we're just having fun. You know, then a certain point there, uh, you say, well, let's, let's have fun. So there's... <laughs> Um, you can kind of also see the background of some of the, just the beautiful area that we uh, had, had growing up in. But, uh, that, by the way, that was uh, Bill Belzer. That's my, uh, you know, at this point, I was a hiking and nature counselor, so I was a bona fide hiking and nature counselor. No, <laughs> I did not know Dr. Johnson at this, this, this point. And, uh, and when I saw this cartoon, I said, oh, yeah. I mean, that's it. I mean, you saw those last, last two pictures of us. So it's not just the kids that uh, were uh, just having, having all kinds of fun in this kind of environment, uh, but also the, uh, also the counselors as well. I mean, we were just like, like little kids. Um, and we look forward you know, to some of the things. And, uh, and I, in a way, I still do, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. Oh, look at that guy in the Madras shorts. <laughs> okay, uh, I was uh, 
15, and one of the kitchen boys, uh, kitchen workers at the, um, at the camp had a guitar. And I was already kind of liked music, and he taught me a few chords and so on how to play. And I just loved it. I mean, I would spend an hours uh, you know, trying to play and, and uh, sing and that sort of thing. So this was a couple years after uh, that, but uh, we were doing a show uh, for the camps. Again, they all got together with some evening. Uh, we're in a big rec hall and that sort of thing. Uh, this is from an old two by two slide and how Karen Frazier made anything out of this, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, there was uh, Jim Pote. He was the one I was singing with there. Now let's go back up to uh, Joe Baus. And uh, this next picture is of Joe Baus. You can't see Joe here, but there he is. And he's playing a plunger with us. <laughs> Folk faculty, what song are we doing? Yes. <laughs> uh, and if, if any of you are familiar with the uh, Timey Kangaroo Down, uh, this is, uh, there's, a, there's a sound in there that goes bop, 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 bop. And we could not figure, I mean, we didn't have YouTube or any of that sort of thing, so we could not figure how they were making that sound. So we said, well, maybe it's a plunger. <laughs> this is our first attempt. We know now it's, it's kind of a cardboard kind of thing. Wop, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> so, so there's Joe in music. That's our kind of first musical uh, experience there. Um, we'll, we'll go back to Joe in, in a, a little bit. Uh, I think my inspira a lot of my inspiration early uh, folk music was Peter, Paul, Mary. Uh, they were started um, probably about 1961. And, then, so th and I think that was the group uh, that I loved. I loved their song, um, modeled a lot of what I did. Uh, but especially, uh, we all have our idols somewhere along the line. Uh, it could be Elvis Presley, not that that would be an idol. Uh, uh, Paul McCartney, if you're a Beatles fan. Uh, to me, I love Peter Yarrow. Uh, here's Peter. There's uh, Noel Paul Snooky, uh, Mary, <laughs> duh. And uh, there's P uh, Peter Yarrow. And I just loved, uh, and I went to see uh, several of their concerts so I could watch him as well. Uh, but I loved his, the, what he, uh, his guitar work. I loved his voice. He, uh, he's the lead singer, and he also wrote uh, Puff the Magic Dragon, if you're familiar with that. So, uh, so I would, a, a lot of songs that I would learn uh, would be the ones that Peter uh, would be doing. So Peter you know, yeah, was my, my idol way, way uh, back. Uh, here's a more recent picture of the group. Uh, actually, Mary uh, died a few years ago, uh, but obviously it was much later. There's uh, in the middle, that's uh, Paul, and there's Peter Yarrow uh, on the very end. So. <clears throat> OK, let's look at the eruption as a volume. I'm going to go through this just really fast, because uh, what I want to emphasize uh, here, uh, primarily that a lot of my history, even though I teach physiology, uh, has really been in ecology and animal behavior. And I want to make that point because that's going to be, I think, important for how things in my life uh, have, uh, have gone in various directions. Um, so I did a postdoc at the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and then uh, taught at North Carolina State University for three years. And fortunately, a course I taught there was animal physiology, and that's probably the only reason I'm at Hendrix, that they were looking for a physiologist, and I had taught it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and maybe one other thing that I'll point out a little bit later as well. But um, then came the Hendrix in uh, 1980. Uh, I was uh, very interested in animal behavior, uh, so I started an animal behavior course in uh, 1982, I believe, 1982, 83, in addition to physiology and so on. Uh, but uh, always had an interest in the human uh, behavior as well. Uh, and I'll just, uh, just because this is kind of like a rehearsal for retirement and where I think uh, if I have any scholarly future, uh, it might be along these lines. Uh, and that um, stemmed from a course that I did, uh, actually co-taught with uh, Dr. McDaniel, with Jay McDaniel, back, I want to say 1986, Jay, something like that, uh, on uh, re uh, religion and science. I forget exactly what the title was. Uh, but I just, it just got me thinking about that. Wow, uh, you know, as a biologist, here we have such a really important human behavioral system. Uh, that guides so much of our lives, uh, why can't this be subjected to biological analysis uh, like any other behavioral sort of thing? So that's, I think, uh, where I'm going with that uh, behavior and so on. But uh, so this is uh, just to go through uh, some of the, um, uh, uh, what we do with the students. Uh, this is from a biology of the human body class, which is basically a human physiology uh, class for non-science majors. Uh, and I like to have a lot of fun. I like 
to do hands-on kinds of things. Me, I, I don't like to lecture. Uh, I'd much rather just be with the students in the lab doing something like that or out in the field as you'll see. Uh, so what they were doing here, were they were making a cell. Okay? Uh, and they had, to, uh, uh, they had to create the organelles and then they would put the organelles in the, in the cell down there and at the end it would look something like this. You can see the nucleus is floating. Uh, okay, I, mean, I won't go through the parts, parts of it, but just to get them involved uh, in doing those sorts of things. And the same is true with ecology. And this is what I want to emphasize now, the ecological component. Uh, I started teaching ecology when um, our ecologist at that time, Tom Clark, which so many of you uh, know, passed away. Uh, and for the next five or so years, uh, started teaching the course. And then we hired uh, Matt Moran to uh, do, uh, teach the ecology course. And then something happened, and I have no idea when we moved over to our new building, but I started teaching ecology <laughs> again. Uh, and, and then ha had for the next uh, uh, you know, s seven or so years. And, um, but also I would teach the uh, environmental biology, which is a ecology course for non-majors, for biology, uh, for non-science uh, majors. So s these pictures are kind of from both of those classes, but the idea uh, of, again, connecting um, students uh, with nature, uh, actually giving them experiences, uh, really with the trees, pond sam uh, stream sampling, and so on. There's happy faces. I didn't know if there were going to be any. Th this was the, s the uh, photograph that might capture several, at least recent, graduates from the environmental. If anybody recognizes himself in, is um, Dylan uh, Blankenship. Yeah. Somebody said that Dylan might be here. And there's the very first photograph of Dylan back there. OK, so. Uh, OK, we're jumping around now, but things are connected. Okay, remember that. So I, I'm on. Uh, but uh, here's um, uh, when I first interviewed uh, Tom Clark, who was obviously in the biology department, said, "Well, Joe, you've uh, I see had some experience uh, coaching youth soccer, and that's because uh, my son uh, played, and I had played a little bit in high school, so I knew a little bit about the game, not too much." I said, "Well," he said, "If you would you be interested in coaching uh, the?" Uh, college team. They're just trying to start up a college team. I said, well, uh, it's a job. I mean, <laughs> sure, I'll do it. So anyway, this is one of the earlier, uh, there's the coach, coach Lombardi and uh, our first uh, soccer team. Uh, also at that time, I was uh, coaching youth soccer. Some of you might uh, recognize uh, their IM, uh, Carl Wartenberg and Karen Wartenberg, yeah, who were also uh, coaches. This is the very first, the very first year uh, this is the Spartans. Uh, 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 Martin Moix? Martin. Ah, Martin. Okay, Martin, Martin's not. That's too bad. If any of you know Martin? Who the, the, he's a gastroenterologist in town. Uh, there he is. <laughs> uh, and then uh, my son, and by the way, I, uh, another uh, point that um, I think maybe uh, Chuck made at one time that I, you don't even think about. When I came here, I was a, a single parent. Uh, and uh, um, my son Carl there was 10 years old. Okay, so that, that was basically, uh, you know, I, in fact, I think about it in terms of coaching and as you'll see, refereeing. And you, where did I get the time and energy to do all that stuff? I mean, you know, cook, you know. Um, okay, so uh, then the uh, next year, uh, since I uh, already was coaching the Hendricks team and had an affiliation. Uh, with the Little Rock and the State Soccer Association, I said, well, let's go ahead and develop a classic team. Uh, so this is not just a parks and recreation team, which was the first uh, picture that I showed you. Uh, but this, uh, the, this was uh, the Cougars. This was the name of the, the group. And uh, you can see Carl Wartenberg and I are coaching them as well. And this is a class we call a classic team. It's an under-14 team. And they would go to other parts of the state uh, and compete against. Uh, Wayne, I already talked about you several times, so you missed, you missed it. <laughs> uh, and there's uh, uh, Carl, uh, Ralph, is that Kevin? Yeah, yeah it's Kevin, <laughs> Kevin McKenna. Uh, there's Carl, and I want to uh, uh, interject here something very quickly uh, about Carl. Uh, Carl, this is uh, him uh, much more recently, obviously. Um, he was a soccer player uh, at uh, Hendricks, and, uh, but uh, was an English major. His, um, his, uh, he is... Um, 
uh, discipline really was creative writing. That's what he wanted to do. And he wanted to be a poet. Uh, and he's still struggling as that. But he was also a performer of poets. He worked for about 12 years uh, with an organization called Poetry Alive. And they would go um, in pairs uh, you know, around the uh, United States and they would perform poems for uh, elementary and high school K through 12 and do workshops with teachers of how to really you know, get kids involved in doing you know, the poetry kind of thing. And he loved it. Those of you that know Carl, a great uh, performer. Uh, and, uh, and still a struggling poet. Well, I came here with not very much uh, experience in soccer. Uh, and so uh, this is, I decided uh, after my first summer uh, that I was here after Hendricks, that I needed to uh, learn something about uh, soccer. So here, and this is a soccer camp in, Pen in Pennsylvania. We were there for a week in tents. Uh, here's our coach. I still remember his name, Lenny Bylas. He was a player for the uh, Brazilian uh, national team. And he was our, yeah, he was the uh, coach, yeah. And it was uh, really good. At that time, Carl was at another part of that same uh, camp, but he was doing, um, you know, he was uh, learning how to play. I was learning how to coach a little bit. Okay, uh, also uh, my f uh, second year here, I decided, you know, I don't know much about the rules of soccer. <laughs> you know, I remember yelling at a referee uh, for, uh, for not, uh, for listening to his linemen about offside. You know, and when you learn even a little bit about soccer, I mean, that's the job of the lineman. <laughs> Who do you listen to him for? It's, you know, and I said, okay, I need to learn something about rules. So I went to a uh, soccer refereeing clinic. And by the way, since then, I've been to several, uh, since then, I shouldn't, I, I really stopped doing this soccer in about uh, 2000. But I uh, had gone to several uh, coaching clinics, uh, several refereeing uh, clinics and so on. But the very next week after I uh, got my, weekend soccer refereeing diploma. Uh, they had me uh, refereeing kinds of things. And that, for the next 19 years, uh, I was refereeing, uh, you know, uh, high school, uh, men's amateur, semi-pro, uh, um, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, the things. Again, I said, where do I get the energy to, uh, to do all that? But anyway, there's me in the middle. I'm not sure uh, where this was taken. Uh, a uh, college coach, uh, college coach, college uh, referee that was taken at UCA. I was doing one of their uh, their games, but the reason I uh, mentioned that is because uh, yeah, well, it, it's to again make that soccer connection. Uh, but so this is a few years later. Uh, this is probably about 1984, 85. I don't know if anybody recognizes Roby Brock. Brock. Okay, <laughs> talk business. There's Roby. Okay, and uh, I, I know sev several of these names, but uh, there's our coach. Okay, Tom Poe, okay. So where's their other coach, Joe Lombardi? <laughs> so, uh, so I started, I said, well, you know, I can play soccer, yeah, just about as well as some of these guys can. By the way, Ian was, was also on that, uh, not, I'm not sure, yeah, this is a little bit before you came here, uh, Ian. But, um, but uh, you know, some of the players were obviously very good, but others, you know, we could keep up with, <laughs> you know, pretty well. So there's... Bill, that's, that's not Hunt Cooper. He was on another picture there. But uh, there's a coach, Joe Lombardi, moves, to the, moves the ball down the field <laughs> toward a possible goaling situation. Well, if anybody saw any of our early games, that that was a possible goal-scoring uh, goal situation is very, very unlikely. <laughs> so, but uh, that's, the, the soccer connection there is important. And I'll show you why. Uh, this is an indoor, uh, our indoor soccer team. And they uh, opened an indoor soccer center in 1990. Uh, in Little Rock, and you'll recognize that handsome gentleman uh, right there. Here I am with the red eyes up there. I think that was the camera, although we sometimes would have a beer, usually on our way back, as opposed <laughs> to to our games. Uh, and two other uh, folks here. Um, Conrad Shoemaker, you can see uh, up uh, here, and, uh, uh, and this other person, Mike Schaefer, uh, down here. So we were all in the boom. The name of the uh, team was the Boomers. And uh, they closed down the center about 1996. And uh, we, so we really didn't have any indoor uh, place to play anymore. So we decided that, uh, we, that we had other interests together. Uh, and those interests were music. And Conrad uh, was also a teacher at the Arkansas Governor's School, as I was. So we uh, decided to do a little coffee house. Uh, and there I am. There's Conrad. And Mike Schaefer, that person who's laying down in the front, uh, uh, <laughs> got together and started making music. So that all stemmed from the fact that we were in that indoor soccer team together. 
Uh, we did a, uh, the, a few weeks after that an open mic at um, UCA. We were invited by uh, Gary Roberts, who was the dean of students, he still is, at UCA. Uh, and he liked us. He said, why don't you come in and perform at the uh, uh, cafe, uh, acoustic cafe that he was running in town. So uh, we did. And uh, they asked us, what is your name? What is the name of your group? So all we had was the Boomers. Because that was our soccer team. Because <laughs> we're the Boomers. <laughs> and that stayed with us. And so here's the uh, Boomers a little bit later. Uh, uh, we um, have another uh, singer now, uh, Sarah. Uh, Gro, who now is Sarah Shoemaker, she married uh, Conrad, and about four years ago, uh, J.D. Hatfield, in the very end, uh, picked up a, uh, is a, our bassist now. So they go through very quick. We do, uh, you know, some shows at, uh, this is uh, EcoFest, and we've been doing that for about the last five years, as well as, you know, we do many other shows as well. I love singing for kids. I love connecting with, uh, with little, ki little kids. You can see them here. And... Uh, here we were doing a, a show at Carlisle, the library at Carlisle, uh, Arkansas, and I had a lot of instruments with me and working with little kids. Uh, you connect so, so well. I mean, with pe music is such a great way to connect, period, and I'll emphasize that a little bit. Uh, but especially with kids, what a wonderful uh, way to, uh, you know, and these are rehearsals for retirement, by the way, that you're seeing for them. Okay. And there's, uh, there's my little girl. And I just love this picture. Uh, we were doing a, um, at the farmer's market, uh, playing at the farmer's market in Argenta, in North Little Rock. And uh, this lady, we didn't know her, and she just left her kids there. She went off and did her shopping. <laughs> and it was great. She must have known. They're going to be fine. <laughs> they're they're going to be, they're going to be fine. And then, of course, I can't leave out with that music con connection, the folk faculty. And this, is this, uh, this came about. Uh, after the boomers, so the boomers kind of really started things, uh, but several of the faculty members are uh, also interested in, uh, in folk music. So, of course, you see Marcus Sutherland there. Uh, there's Ralph McKenna, uh, uh, Stella Chopic. Uh, so they became the folk faculty. And this is a more recent one. Uh, Jay, I really apologize. I don't have a picture of the folk faculty with you playing with us uh, or with David Hinson. I don't know if David is, uh, is here. Uh, but Dan, this one, uh, we do have Danny Henderson uh, over there on the far uh, right. So here's the folk factory we were doing at Red Light Review, I think, uh, two years ago. <coughs> okay, so here's how, kind of where I, I want to go. Uh, uh, let me spend a few moments, not a few moments. Uh, but this uh, is a group. Uh, this is, uh, for the last 15 years, I've been uh, working during the summer uh, with an um, environmental education program. It's a summer institute in environmental education through uh, Kentucky. And the two directors of that program uh, <coughs> are Terry Wilson, who you see way up here, uh, and you'll see him again in a moment, and this guy here. Does anybody recognize? Okay, there he is. And uh, back in about 1998, I got a call from uh, Joe Baust. There he is. I got a call from Joe Baust, uh, and he was just kind of going, uh, uh, contacting former camp counselors and campers. And uh, he said, what are you doing? And so on. I told him, well, teaching ecology, teaching envir environmental biology, the whole thing. He said, well, we run a program, uh, an environmental education program. I would love for you to come up and join us in that program. And what that program does is to uh, get teachers, K through 12 teachers, uh, and we then go work with them on how to incorporate environmental types of things into anything that they're doing. If, if you're a, a writer, if you want to write uh, poetry, or you want to, uh, you know, literature, you can do it. You can incorporate environmental kinds of things. If you're teaching math, uh, you can still teach math with environmental kinds of things and so on. So the whole idea is to give them practice and training and get them involved uh, in, so they, uh, in that so they can go and work with their kids. So for instance, here, uh, they're sensing, we're trying, again, to establish this sense of wonder uh, in many of these, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, we don't call it participants. Not, they're not really students, I guess they are, but they're, they're, these are teachers. Um, and uh, experience, uh, in this case a tree. Uh, this is a forest study that we're doing with them um, where they're um, writing perhaps a poetry about a tree, uh, doing some visual arts. That might be a, uh, something that uh, she had been uh, drawing. <coughs> and uh, again, doing stream sampling and that sort of thing. Again, getting them involved, giving them the techniques and even some of the equipment, nets and that sort of thing, to go back and get their kids outside. One of the programs is no child left inside. You know. 
And you can already see now the connection with camp. I mean, this is, and, and this program has been a summer camp for Joe and for me. You know, they, they, we just look forward uh, to it, as I said, about 15, uh, 15 years now. Well, here's music. Again, this is the, uh, the same summer institute. Uh, and there's uh, Joe Baus. Now he's playing guitar. Do you remember where he was before? <laughs> Connections. Oh, man. I think it is. And uh, here I am. And this um, fellow here, his name is John Short, but I'll, I'll sh and, uh, say something more about John and uh, show you another picture of him. But he, uh, he got involved in this program because he, well, he's an elementary school teacher, music teacher, and he would make instruments, banjos and dulcimers, out of recycled materials and so on. So you can see the environmental uh, connection uh, to all that. So he's a banjo player, also a dulcimer player. Uh, there, I just want to show you Joe Bouse. And here we are. Uh, this is a group um, uh, at um, a working um, uh, um, uh, word I'm trying to think of a uh, homestead, a working homestead where they actually plant uh, their own food and that sort of thing. And we dressed up in 1860s garb and again uh, to uh, do folk music with those guys. There's Joe. Uh, and remember, by the way, I had not seen Joe in 30 years. So you can imagine from that picture when he was a counselor to what he looked like there. So, you know. And now he looks the same as he did back when he was a counselor. So. And there's John. And here we are again. And this was at a national uh, conference for the North American Association for Environmental Education uh, in 2007. Here's Joe Baus. Uh, some of you might recognize John McCutcheon, who's a very nationally known uh, folk singer and so on. Uh, this is my particular session in that uh, uh, part of that symposium. The symposium was music, how to incorporate music into environmental education. Uh, this guy's name is John uh, Euline, uh, more regionally he's in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. There's John Short uh, back there. Anybody recognize him? I got plenty, yeah. <laughs> uh, and since then, uh, not, he's, he's been involved. He, he now does, uh, works with um, anti-bullying. He calls it Operation Respect. And now he's extended that to Operation uh, Nature, or uh, Operation Nature Respect, or Environmental Respect, that's it. Uh, basically saying you need to respect the environment. So, so he's, that's how he got involved in that conference uh, through Joe. You know, I showed you Peter Paul Mayer back in 1960. <laughs> You know, here I am. He's, he's backing me up on stage, by the way. <laughs> okay. And there's uh, Joe Baus, uh, Peter Yarrow, and I. He came to the uh, actual institute, uh, the Summer Institute, and worked with uh, some of the uh, stu students uh, there as well. Um, my son, Carl, uh, also got involved in the um, Summer Institute, uh, working with the, uh, with the teachers on uh, writing poetry, performing poetry with, again, an environmental uh, kick to it. So there's Carl with Peter Yarrow. Peter was uh, doing some Puff the Magic Dragon books that he had uh, written. And uh, uh, this is going to come up in April, uh, Peter Yarrow and uh, Carl. And Carl performs, by the way, the Lorax, the uh, Dr. Zeus uh, Lorax. So uh, part of that same, uh, same program. I'm going to go see uh, both of them uh, in a couple of weeks. So it's kind of a fun kind of thing. Okay, let's wrap up our metaphor now, as you're already hopefully getting a sense for that, uh, of all the, uh, the uh, flow and the mixing and never know what's, what's going to happen. Uh, but go back all the way to the beginning there. And this just blew me away. Uh, and Bob, you were there when I was talking with Jennifer Pesca about high school. And you know, until that time, about five months ago, I had not read my high school uh, yearbook. I looked at it a few times for a reunion here and there to see if I could recognize people and so on. But when you talk about you know, passions and, and things, the, the directions you're taking your life, here's a high school. I just blew me away. Uh, he Rocky, okay, that's my nickname. Activities include soccer, no track, the student association representative, this folk singing, guitar playing, likes blondes. I think my, my uh, date to the prom was blonde, or maybe it was Mary and Peter Paul Mary. I don't know how they got that. His ambition is to be a biologist. Yeah, 
in high school, I had no idea what I was going to be, where I was going to go. And I, I'm, you know, I think about what I've been telling you. <laughs> Soccer, guitar play, singer. And uh, I look back at that, I said, you know, way, way back. So you can see then how all of those uh, things from the original energy connect, interconnect, uh, and so on. And you don't, you don't know where, where they're going to lead, but everything leads to, you know, something that's you rehearsed in, in a way. And then to finish the metaphor, and this is going to mix the metaphor a little bit, but you have this barren ground here. Uh, but you can see there are little, you, know, you might not see in this picture too well, but little sprouts uh, in, after that volcanic eruption and all of our energy uh, that's laying some fertile groundwork for, you know, as a teacher, we like to think that some of the things we do actually end up uh, allowing this kind of growth, hopefully our students and other people that we contact and come in touch with. Um, a better metaphor, if I could, if could do it, would be if that would turn into other little volcanoes, but they're not doing that. So we'll do the best we can with, you know, it's better than smoke. <laughs> okay. And then lastly, uh, the sunshine on my shoulders. I've not uh, mentioned uh, my wife, uh, Melissa, of 18 years, uh, now uh, ensures that whatever uh, this retirement is going to uh, lead to, you're not going to hang around the house on a sofa. You're getting your butt outside. So, so I'm sure she'll be very instrumental in doing that. Uh, my uh, son, or our son, um, Aaron, who uh, this is a little, uh, maybe a year or so ago, uh, he's going to turn 16 this summer, and I'm sure he'll keep me uh, quite busy and uh, keep me uh, entertained. There's the fertile fields in the back, uh, and uh, we're traveling forward, and I just love this next picture when we talk about nature and kids and impact. It's my favorite picture. Thank you. <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for coming.